And I, for one, love to hear the stories uh, of some of the work that's been done. Uh, and I know a lot of our listeners do as well. So could we get into some of the specifics of these, these mountains that have been moved uh, by the work that's been done? Could you share? Um, so, so for example, I think about, you know, the Abby Johnson story that I, I referenced earlier. Um, there's a 40 days for life presence outside of the clinic she was at. Um, she, you know, saw what abortion was and it was interacting with, uh, with those workers there and ended up becoming pro-life, which was phenomenal. But one of the things you've referenced is this is, is not just a one-off story. I mean, this happens time and again in the UK and the States and Canada, uh, in various different places. So, could you share with us a little bit more about, I don't know, just like a specific life that was saved or a specific clinic that was closed and how it happened, uh, or even, you know, a, a worker or two that that um, stopped working within the industry because of the presence of 40? Yes, so um, absolutely. I'll come on to London in a second. Abby Johnson, I mean, uh, everybody knows her story. She's helped over 500 abortion workers leave through, and then there were none. Her ministry, she came to London in 2013, and we... Um, we did a tour around the UK with her and, you know, Unplanned Now has been shown all around the world. So it just shows you that the power of one person's conscience, you know, not only our headquarters is in the, the former Planned Parenthood building in Bryan, um, but her story has been heard all around the world through the Unplanned movie. Um, and in London, our, our abortion centre closed. We organised our first vigil in 2010. Um, it was the second day the couple were going into the abortion centre and they don't allow born children into the abortion centre. So uh, the, the, the boyfriend had to wait outside um, with two born children as her, his girlfriend went into the abortion centre. And he started talking with the volunteers for like 15 minutes. And uh, after that time, he rushed into Mary Stokes. Uh, he got his girlfriend and they left and uh, never to come back again. And from that moment, I just thought, you know, we're, we're on to <laughs> a winner here. If the, you know, it's day two and we've seen a baby saved already. Um, we also had a mum who had a dream and she thought that her baby was calling out to her in her dream, you know, mummy, mummy, please don't abort me. This was the night before she was scheduled to have the abortion. And uh, the pro-life counsellor that day helped her to discern that that was the dream and this was uh, her baby was calling out to her in, in her dream and she decided not to go ahead with the abortion. Uh, another person walked down the, the line of prayer volunteers shaking their hands of each one, one of them um, saying, you yeah, know, thank you so much for being here. If it wasn't for people like you, you know, then my, um, you know, my my girlfriend would not have chosen chosen life. So we saw six babies saved on our first ever campaign in the UK, and then we moved to the British Pregnancy Advisory Centre, uh, which is the British abortion provider, the largest abortion charity in the UK, and that was in a Victorian big square. And we organised a vigil there for three years. So we did seven campaigns, about three thousand hours of prayer outside that abortion centre. And at every campaign, we saw about six babies saved. And um, there were cyclists that came past. It was on a cyclist ro- uh, lane. So some of them were like kamikaze cyclists. They didn't like our message. So uh, you got some positive messages and, you, and you've got people shouting at you, you know, telling you where to go, uh, telling you number one. But uh, our presence there was really powerful. And we uh, got the bishop to come to the prayer vigil in 2012. And the prayer abortion lobby kicked up a massive storm at that point because um, one of the pro-life leaders, John Smeaton, head of SBUC, said uh, the pro-abortion lobby know how powerful the, the bishops are in getting them involved and how important that is. And so we had a, uh, we had a protest of about 500 uh, abortion protesters turn up while the bishop came, which brought a lot of traction. We brought several hundred pro-lifers were there at the same time. So there's a huge standoff between the pro aborts there and the pro-lifers who were just quietly praying there and the pro-abortionists who are making sacrilegious jokes and uh, shouting and making a lot of noise. But the abortion centre closed um, the following the following year, and we had a prayer vigil inside the abortion building uh, the day after they, their lease was terminated. We wrote to the Duke of Bedford. He gave us permission. He was the, the landowner um, who owned the building. And so we had a prayer service. We had a mass inside the building um, the day after the abortion centre closed. And so in the words of the Eucharist, uh, Jesus says, this is my body given for you. Uh, abortion advocates cling to their own bodies that uh, others may die, but... but Jesus gives of his own body that others may live. So all the shouting, all the abuse we'd had for years, we'd had a lot of abuse and, um, you know, people throwing eggs at us and this this kind of thing for years. We knew that all that was was worth it because we saw that abortion centre close. And, and since that time, we've seen Belfast, uh, Leamington Spa, Birmingham, Nottingham, and now, now um, Brighton has closed. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Pro-Life Guys podcast. 
If you want to learn more about the abortion war, if you want to hear some great conversations that we have with some of our pro-life heroes, or if you want to learn apologetics, how you can winsomely and effectively and compassionately have conversations on abortion so that you too can see someone change their mind and see lives saved, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any of our new content.